Terrific. Well, um, so we are I'm live. Pleased uh, ambassador to uh, to have you join us today. My name is Robert Baines. I am the president and the CEO of the NATO Association of Canada, a organization dedicated to informing Canadians about the value of security and the importance of NATO. Uh, it's a conversation that doesn't always happen for most Canadians most of the time. So it's our job to make sure that Canadians understand what the NATO alliance is and how valuable NATO is to Canadians' everyday life. Uh, it is one of the most important foundations of our peace and security. Uh, and today we're thrilled to talk with one of the uh, ambassadors of uh, one of our great NATO allies, Portugal, uh, and to discuss some of the transatlantic issues that include both Canada and Portugal. Uh, and to do that today, I am pleased to introduce Maria Zelenova, one of our program editors at the NATO Association of Canada uh, and a great member of our team. Maria, please take us away. Thank you, Robert. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our series of events discussing the future of North Atlantic cooperation. As Robert said, my name is Maria, and I am program editor at, uh, and ambassador coordinator at the NATO Association. And we are a non-for-profit organization aimed at educating Canadians on the value of security and importance of NATO. We are honored to be joined today by His Excellency Joao da Camara and Deputy Head of Mission Joao Paulo Costa. Thank you so much for joining us today, Ambassador. Uh, and now for a quick introduction, Ambassador Joao da Camara joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1984 after spending some time in the military service. After starting, the, uh, starting at the Department for European Integration, he served at the embassy in uh, Pretoria in 1989 and the embassy of Brasilia in, in 1994. Thereafter, the ambassador was appointed as deputy, as uh, director of the European Department in 1997 and as head of cabinet for a Minister of State and European Affairs in 1999. In 2000, the ambassador was appointed as Minister Counselor at the Embassy in London. In 2003, he became Director of Sub-Saharan Africa Department and a Deputy Director General at the Directorate of the European Union Affairs in 2004. In 2005, Ambassador Joao da Camara became the Director of Foreign Intelligence Service. Thereafter, he took on positions as ambassador to Zimbabwe in 2008, Angola in 2012, India in 2015, and finally, ambassador to Canada in 2018. Ambassador Joao da Camara graduated with a degree uh, in law from the Faculty of Human Sciences at Catholic University of Portugal. And after that lengthy introduction, Ambassador, I will now pass it on to you for your remarks. And for the audience, we will have about 30 minutes of a moderated discussion with opening remarks and uh, prepared moderated questions. And after that, we will open the floor to questions from the audience. So please feel free to ask your questions in the YouTube chat. Over to you, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start by thanking the NATO Association of Canada and President Robert Baines for organizing this event. And you, and I'm very, very glad glad to be given this opportunity. My intervention will focus mainly on Portugal's role in NATO, its contribution to international security, and how we perceive the main challenges that the alliance, that the alliance is currently facing. I will also briefly highlight the bilateral relationship in security and defense between Portugal and Canada. So uh, I will begin by stating that Portugal is a true Atlantic country. Its pioneering spirit and maritime heritage, combined with, with its uh, geographic uh, location, made it an appealing candidate to become, in 1949, one of the 12 founding members of the Atlantic Alliance. Continental Portugal is part of the Iberian Peninsula and together with the angle of protection for NATO. The Azores Archipelago, is located one third of the way between Portugal's west coast and the Canadian east coast, providing crucial transatlantic connections and defending vital sea routes. This geostrategic geo relevance was clearly the reason why an authoritarian regime was invited to be a founding member of the Atlantic Alliance. On the other hand, we could ask why was that same authoritarian regime so keen to give up his neutrality status in favor of an alliance 
with the Western winners of the war. First of all, because being a member of NATO gave legitimacy to the regime. Second, because Spain was left out and that gave us the opportunity to affirm our foreign policy and our strategic interests apart from the strategic interests of Spain, a neighboring country with whom we had at that time a difficult dialogue and a lot of mistrust. And finally, because being a member of NATO allowed the regime to fulfill a very important object to fight, to fight international communism. Whatever may be the reasons for being invited and for accepting the invitation, the fact is that Portugal was from the beginning at the heart of the alliance, and NATO has been over time, during and after the Cold War, an element of central relevance for both our international and domestic policies. At the domestic level, Portugal NATO has been an essential pillar of Portugal defense policy, an instrumental for the modernization capacities and interoperability between the various members of the alliance. NATO was undoubtedly a central instrument in the affirmation of Portugal as a producer of international security. Through its commitment to the alliance, both politically and militarily, Portugal has been and remains a key line in efforts towards keeping the walls. In Portugal, NATO is the NATO Academy of Communications and Information and the command of strike for NATO. Uh, and it's a naval striking and support forces. Portugal's participation in NATO missions and operations is an essential instrument for affirming and enhancing Portugal's role in the international stage. This is particularly important in the pursuit of its foreign policy objectives, which include the defense of multilateralism and a rules-based international order. Since the 90s, Portugal has been present in various missions, land, air, and naval of the Atlantic Alliance in Europe, Bosnia and Kosovo, but also in Iraq, Afghanistan, the Mediterranean, and the Indian Ocean, in the Indian Ocean. More recently, Portugal has also contributed regularly to the air policing of the Baltic region, Iceland, and the Black Sea region in the context of the assurance measures and of the tailored forward presence in Romania. Portugal's contribution to NATO operations during 2021 represents more than 50% 50, 50 of our military personnel and budget for overseas missions. And this has been the case for many years. Today, we are fully committed to a 360 degree approach with our forces currently present in NATO missions all over. At the same time, we are increasingly engaged with other partners and other international organizations in the fight against terrorism and instability, namely in the Sahel, the Central African Republic, the Horn of Africa, and Mozambique. Portugal is also contributing to various um, European Union and UN missions, and in the framework of several bilateral agreements, is, acti is actively engaged in military technical cooperation activities with several Portuguese-speaking countries, mainly in Africa. We are not a global power, but we are definitely a global player with friends and interests from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from the Americas to the, to the Oceania. This is the result of our inheritance as an old maritime country that contributed decisively to open the doors to globalization. Uh, now I'll speak a little bit about the, the new international security environment and the Portugal's approach to the alliance challenges. Uh, we share the perception that NATO is now facing the most complex security environment since the end of the Cold War. In fact, existing, existing threats have not gone away. Russia's behavior remains assertive and destabilizing, as we can watch in the, the last, these last days in the border with Ukraine. And terrorism continues to, preserve, pres, pr, to persevere as a global security threat. At the same time, the rise of China is shifting the global 
balance of power. We also live in a world of growing global uncertainty, more sophisticated and disruptive cyber and hybrid threats and exponential technological change and, and exponential technological change rapidly transforming the way wars are fought. And climate change will certainly add to existing security challenges and generate new ones. Now that NATO has achieved the two, there are two main conditions, in my view, to keep NATO relevant while safeguarding freedom and security. First, the need to reinforce the political dimension of the alliance by promoting its members' fundamental values. NATO is and should remain a privileged platform for transatlantic political and strategic consultations. It is beneficial for both Europe and North America. Second, the importance to ensure that the alliance continues to adapt and work at full operational capacity, effectively accomplish its core tasks and responsibilities, collective security. Politically, 2021 is a crucial year for NATO. The meeting of NATO heads and state and government that will be held in Brussels later this year will be the first summit with the president with the presence of the US President Biden after four years of very tense relations among allies. There are high hopes that this meeting can be a turning point and that will create a new, a new climate of trust and understanding. Looking ahead, I would like to highlight three areas of special relevance to Portugal. The transatlantic relation that for us in both alliance, NATO and union relationship, and the impact of COVID-19, defense spending, and public perception of the alliance. As I mentioned before, the, NATO, the, the next NATO summit will open a new chapter in transatlantic relations, while setting the direction for the future of our alliance to 2030 and beyond. This is also the time to update the NATO strategic concept. As you know, the current document was adapt, adopted in Lisbon in 2010. We should take this as an opportunity for our allies to address existing and emerging challenges, strengthen our values and reinforce the bond between Europe and North America. Portugal is actively contributing to this review. We favor, as I mentioned before, the 30, uh, 306 degree approach and also a strong transatlantic partnership on defense innovation so that NATO can keep its technological edge. It won't come as a surprise that we all also attribute special relevance to the southern dimension of NATO. We are particularly concerned with the threats emanating from the Sahel and with the questions of security in the Mediterranean. And of course, the new concept should naturally reflect the relevance of cyberspace and the need to respond to hybrid threats as well. In what concerns the NATO-European Union relations, um, I would say that Portugal currently holds the presidency of the Council of the European Union and has identified the strengthening of the translate of transatlantic relations as one of its core priorities. NATO embodies the unique bond that unites Europe and North America. As a member of both organizations, Portugal truly believes that the deepening of the NATO-European Union cooperation is the best way to address common challenges and strengthen the security of the Euro-Atlantic area. Portugal is particularly engaged in ensuring coherence and complementarity between NATO and the European defense. We have only one set of forces and cannot duplicate efforts. The challenge we face today are too great for any nation or organization to deal with alone. Committed to cooperating in response to hybrid threats, including matters related to cybersecurity and cyber defense. At the level of the European Union capability development, for, for example, 
in other EU defense initiatives and maximize the employment of our resources. Portugal strongly advocates, for instance, for the full participation of non member and military missions, as it happens already in Mali. In a year dominated by the COVID 19 pandemic, NATO priority has been to ensure that the health crisis does not become a security crisis as the NATO in general recently stated. And the good news are that according to the report, European allies and Canada increased their defense spending in real terms by 3.9% from 2019 to 2020. And also, 2021 will be the seventh consecutive year of increased defense spending by the European allies and Canada. Nine allies are expected to spend 2% of GDP on defense, compared to only three in 2014. Since 2014, European allies and Canada have contributed a cumulative extra of $190 billion. And this year, 24 allies will meet the guideline of investing at least 20% of their defense budgets into major new equipment. Portugal remains committed to the defense investment pledge agreed in Wales in 2014. For recent years, we have striving to maintain a growing, a growing trajectory situation. The the report confirms that Portugal's defense budget in 2020 is the biggest since 2013. Despite the socioeconomic impact of the pandemic, the Portuguese defense budget has not been affected. And as a consequence of that, our armed forces could be actively, actively engaged supporting our national uh, vaccination plan. Interesting, interestingly, the the report also presents results of new polls on the public perception of the alliance. These show that in a year of upheaval, overall support for NATO alliance remains strong. In a vote, uh, if, if a vote were held, 62% of NATO citizens would vote for the nation to remain a member of the alliance. The polls uh, have also shown that, that Portugal is the fifth country in NATO where citizens are more supportive of the alliance. 78% of the Portuguese support NATO. And I have to add that the first four are countries that feel directly threatened. And for that reason, they value more the support of the allies. It is not the case of Portugal being on the other side of Europe, at least the other side of Europe, whether where the most evident threats come from. Um, our support for NATO is consequently not a question of a, a direct threat, but a general perception that being part of the organization is important for our own defense and security. As a matter of interest, that is in, in that, you know, it's a good work that could be done by organization to, to to, to get Canada a little bit higher in, the, in this list. And now, finally, I would speak a bit about the, 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 the relation between Portugal and Canada. Uh, Portugal high, highly values Canada as both a like-minded ally and transatlantic partner. Our relationship is founded on shared values and the pursuit of common goals. The presence of a strong Portuguese diaspora in Canada of around 480,000 Portuguese and Portuguese descendants is a strong element of this bond and one that we greatly cherish. And he's meeting with Justin Trudeau in May 2018. Our leaders issue a Canada Portugal statement on enhanced cooperation. His joint political declaration stresses the commitment of, of both countries 
to the friendship and values that unite us, while sig signaling the interest in deepening collaboration in areas such as peace and security, trade, oceans, gender equality, and people-to-people -people ties. It is a concrete reflection of our political importance and strategic value of our bilateral relationship. Portugal looks across the ocean to Canada as a reliable partner that is equally investing in the bond that unites Europe and North America. Security and defense is a specific field that offers great potential for enhanced bilateral exchanges. We have a dialogue between our Minister of Defense and the prospects for cooperation at various levels in the field of defense. In conclusion, Portugal has been for many decades a committed member of NATO, fully engaged in contributing to the unity, cohesion, and solidarity within the organization, and has benefited from a valuable experience of working closely with allies such as Canada. As founding members of NATO, Portugal and Canada have an enduring commitment to the alliance, but, uh, but our ties go well beyond that. By working together at the bilateral and multilateral levels, both countries can further build a more prosperous, peaceful and secure world. Thank you very much for having me and for your time. And I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for that fantastic introduction. Uh, I would agree with you. I think it's definitely uh, very important to keep keeping in mind the bilateral relationship between Portugal and Canada, as those are two certainly very important um, partners to the NATO alliance. Uh, and so to kick off the discussion, we do have some questions prepared for you. Um, our first question is, in times of peace, those who are dedicated to the rules-based international order have to reaffirm that they are willing to stand up for multilateralism. How can Portugal and Canada grow multilateral support from their citizens? Well, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the, of the, the main um, uh, priorities for our uh, foreign policy. It's to, to, to create awareness about multilateralism. Um, and and uh, and uh, and the fact and 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 it's a fact. It's a it's something that it's quite uh, uh, bipartisan in 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 Portugal. Um, our most is in Portugal uh, are very. That uh, also, but also at the level of the, of the, of the United Nations, all and, and the the, the, com uh, the community of Portuguese speaking countries, we favor in in all our being a small country like Portugal, we have uh, added interest in 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 uh, in all that it's uh, related to the to the um, to the multilateral. Of course, we 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 have a we have a bilateral relations, friends and interests all over the world, and uh, and we and we have very good bilateral relations in 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 the Americas, in Africa, in Europe, in Asia, etc. But being a small country, it's it's uh, it's um, it's uh, it's it's only natural that we tend to 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 favor also. This dimension of the international relations, and and uh, and uh, we are a, a very active uh, player uh, in all these organizations that I just mentioned, including including uh, NATO. Um, it's not by chance that the Secretary General of the Nations is a Portuguese of uh, the International Commission. Was until recently a Portuguese, um, and that uh, that, uh, that we have this tradition of uh, of being very much involved uh, in all that it's uh, international organization, and we favor naturally uh, multilateralism and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, rules based international order that comes from the 
from the from the multilateralism. Thank you very much, Ambassador. That was an excellent response. Uh, and uh, it's certainly very important to keep growing support for multilateralism uh, from home uh, first. And uh, thank you again. So I would just like to remind the audience that uh, please feel free to ask any questions you may have in the YouTube chat. Uh, and as we are moving towards our uh, question and answer period with the audience as well. But for now, my next question for the ambassador is, uh, COVID has certainly changed the world as we know it, including how uh, we conduct diplomacy. So in your view, what is the biggest impact of the pandemic on diplomatic cooperation between Portugal and Canada, uh, but also more broadly between NATO allies? Yeah, to rethink the way diplomacy is done, you know, uh, diplomatic relations are very much uh, um, based on personal and, 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 and intimate uh, relationship, but this is very difficult to to be done through through the the, the the way we are doing it. Of course, we can do it like this and. And for certain for certain aspects of our of our work, it's very useful to have uh, and, 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 and maybe the pandemic opened the, the the door to to this type of exchanges more often that are easy. They they don't have the, the obstacle of uh, of space in the in the in the middle of us. But uh, but the fact is that the, the diplomacy is done also and. and and, 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 um, and very, very, uh, very much through the, 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 the uh, personal interactions. And this has been quite, uh, quite difficult during the last, uh, the last year. Um, as a matter of fact, for, for my work, uh, it, it, was, uh, it was quite disturbing that I could not see um, members of government, I could not see uh, members of parliament, I could not see uh, premiers, I could not see a lot of uh, a lot of people, um, and uh, and uh, uh, yeah. So this was this was something that was very disruptive. Um, the, the 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 relation, uh, you know, we didn't have any visits of any ministers from Portugal to to Canada, and. and uh, and none of the, the, the Canadian ministers went to Portugal this last year. I think they didn't go anywhere in, 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 uh, anyway. So, um, and, and of course, the, 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 in, in, in terms of uh, in the, 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 the impact in the military and the military cooperation was also very affected because um, there was less operations in the field uh, less coordination um, and uh, and uh, and so uh, very very important impact in in the, and I hope that soon we'll be able to become uh, to go back to 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 normal uh, because yeah the, the relations would, would benefit from from that we have a we have a a, a, a very a very intense agenda in front of us that can only be fulfilled if uh, if if, uh, if there will be an opportunity for for personal contacts and of visits and and, and and all that thank you very much ambassador uh, and uh, our next question is uh with the uh, sort of as a follow-up to this question as well with the ever-changing times um what do you think some of the potential challenges or issues that need to be addressed in order to uh, preserve close ties uh, within the NATO alliance for the future. You know, there were certainly some challenges that the NATO alliance was facing even before the pandemic began, and those challenges have evolved uh, as the pandemic has progressed. Yeah. Yeah, the, first of all, uh, if we could go back to a more uh, normal situation, um, namely in the relations with uh, between allies and the United States, would be a uh, uh, these last four years were quite tense. Uh, 
uh, there was a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of uh, of, um, of difficult dialogue between some of the members of the alliance. And uh, we hope that uh, um, we hope with the new American administration, the things could go back um, to a little bit what was the, the normal, you know, the, 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 the relations have been always uh, challenging. It's, it's not that uh, that um, that uh, that they were not challenging before, but uh, but uh, with uh, the recent the the recent uh, four years were quite were, were quite difficult. We we can become we can go back to a more uh, normal situation. Um, but uh, but uh, uh, yes, there was. Uh, uh, um, Brexit brought some some new elements to the to the to NATO. Uh, then the pandemic. Now the problem with uh, between Greece and Turkey that it's not a new problem, but, but uh, it can came out uh, more recently a different approach in in what the relations with Russia. Is concerned. So we have a, a, a lot of challenges uh, already. Before we had a lot of challenges before the before the the, the, the Trump administration and uh, and and before the the, the, the pandemic. So uh, now you know at least with uh, with the new administration in Washington and with uh, with the uh, with the end of the pandemic that we hope will come soon. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll face the, uh, uh, a more uh, a, a, a situation that we are more used to and, and, and to try to, 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 to face the, the challenges that are, um, even at the political level, uh, they, are not, uh, they are not few. But of course, it's very important, like I mentioned in my intervention, political dialogue. To the, the the new political dimension in the in 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 NATO um, overcome all the all the problems that we 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 may have and uh, and um, yeah so this is what I had to say about. It. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, and I would also certainly hope that the pandemic provides an opportunity to overcome these challenges as we are moving out and looking at a um, and, and looking at the post-pandemic world. Uh, so my last prepared question is: Without a doubt, you've had a very exciting diplomatic career. Uh, what would you say are some notable highlights from your career, and what do you think is what would you consider to be your greatest achievement in this regard? Hmm. Yeah, it's very difficult to say. You know, my first posting abroad was South Africa. I arrived in Pretoria. It was still times of apartheid, and I left after the election of Nelson Mandela. I had the opportunity to meet Nelson Mandela the day he came out of jail, and uh, and then I met him many times. I I, I organized his uh, first visit to Portugal, even he was he, he was still not the president. Uh, I brought him. To see a football match in Portugal, a soccer match. So I, these are you know things that um, that gives you good memories. But in the in my case, it was South Africa in a very very exciting times, all the period of transition. So this I would say it was the most uh, rewarding experience for me in term, in professional terms. But but then came Brazil, and Brazil was uh, fantastic as well. Also, a period of big changes there, from uh, from the military regime to the to democracy, and uh, and and then London is always uh, uh, British politics are always fun and, and interesting, and it was also a, a quite a meaningful um, time uh, in the history of uh, of uh, Great Britain. It was exactly. The opposite of now. It was the time when when Britain wanted to be at the heart of Europe. Uh, now, recently, they 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 did, but but uh, at the time, they, so it was very 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 interesting to see how they would uh, 
I, how, how they would um, I, how they would react react to the fact that Britain was for the first time uh, wanted to be at the heart of Europe. So, and then uh, you know uh, I went to Zimbabwe because I thought that the regime was going to change there. At that time, I wanted to to duplicate my experience that I had in South Africa. Now with Zimbabwe, Mugabe was going to fall. Then he didn't fall. I stayed there for many years waiting him for him to fall and he didn't then angola was angola is for us very very important all the 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 all the education that this sometimes um, uh, so it was interesting too and then india which is a fascinating country um, also with a uh, historical ties with with portugal and uh, so it was also very interesting but if i could if and, and now canada which it's for uh, completely different reasons is also a very very interesting post um, but i would say that uh, if i could highlight the big moment of my career, it's definitely South Africa and that period of transition between apartheid and democracy and, and the fact that I was, that I was, um, that I had the opportunity to, to meet a few times a, a great figure of our, of our times, uh, Nelson Mandela. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, that sounds absolutely like an absolutely fascinating experience. And I'm sure that watching history unfold be before your eyes throughout your career was certainly very um, impactful and rewarding. So thank you for sharing that with us. It's uh, very, very interesting. Uh, so that was all for me. We will now be taking questions from the audience. So I would just like to remind everyone in the audience that you're welcome to ask any questions you have for the ambassador in the chat on YouTube. Uh, and our first question from the audience is, you have had a very distinguished career at the intersection of defense and diplomacy. What are some key priorities during your term in Canada? And uh, as also part of that question, uh, what impact has COVID-19 had on defense priorities? Yeah, the, 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 my key priorities here is to to enhance uh, cooperation between Portugal and Canada, we have uh, we have uh, you know uh, um, a, a long history between our two countries. Uh, even before, e even before, or more than Canada, Portuguese fishermen used to come to come to Canada to fish and and indigenous peoples, and um, and then after more than Canada. Uh, we have been having a, a very, very strong uh, relationship uh, that uh, was um, also with the, the with the, the Portuguese diaspora here. Uh, uh, also helped uh, to to forge the, uh, the this type of this type of ties. And, but uh, but of course we have uh, this long history. We have uh, uh, shared values and, in, and 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 principles. We. We have a lot of common interests, but the 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 the, the content of the relationship is still not very. It's not very inclusive, and not not very. Um, uh, there's still a lot to be done. So we 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 have already started a few dials in few um, different areas. We have a quite decent economic, you know, still with a lot. Lot of potential to grow, um, and the political uh, interactions are uh, are also uh, not bad, but they could be better. So, um, my my idea was to identify areas of convergence and and and, and common interest, um, like uh, you know uh, science and technology, the digital, um, uh, you know. Defense and, and and defense to ask the the second question. Uh, it's uh, it's maybe one of the areas of our bilateral relationship that is uh, that it's more um, it's it's more it's growing more or it's it's more. 
becoming more and more important. Um, we have a, we have a permanent dialogue between our ministers of defense, and uh, and this can bring you know this dialogue then can bring to to other to other um, uh, to to to, to uh, another dimension of of this relationship. But the, 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 as an ambassador, which you know it's it's like this. Uh, um, it's like this all over. When you become an ambassador, you try to promote and to increase the relations between Portugal and the country where you are accredited. And with Canada, it's not different from, from the others. Here, I see a big, big potential, a, a lot of interest. And it's, what I have to do is just to, to, to be a, to in a role of matchmaking uh, between institutions, between entities, between uh, companies, and, and to try to, to, to put them together with Canadian uh, entities and institutions, and to try from, you know, uh, uh, relations are done mainly by people, uh, by people, by, by institutions, by companies, and, and this, what's the role of the ambassador is try to promote that and, and to encourage uh, um, Portuguese companies to come here and Canadian companies to go to, go to Portugal and all other institutions uh, to to have um, to have uh, more close links with uh, with one another um, and uh, yeah so so that's that's uh, mainly what I had to say. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, our next question is. In terms of diaspora and consular support, is Canada still a preferable country for Portuguese communities to live in? Yeah, no, very much so. It's uh, uh, and, uh, and you can see that we have a. Uh, uh, um, it, this shows it. For instance, we have a mobility agreement, a youth mobility agreement with Canada, so that uh, youth from both countries. Uh, youngsters can go, you know, Canadian youngsters can go to Portugal and Portuguese youngsters can come here for a period of uh, one year and to do whatever they want. Uh, holidays, work, uh, um, you know, uh, study, whatever. Wh they can come here for one year to do whatever they want, travel. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, the fact is that we have a, a, a big response, mainly from the Portuguese coming here, not so much from the Canadians going to Portugal, but uh, but um, but we had a good response, and you can see that there's a, a big interest. Um, the fact that there are more than four hundred thousand Portuguese of, of Portuguese of people here that uh, that consider themselves uh, Portuguese um, uh, it, it tells you a lot that that uh, uh, it's one of the biggest community. It is expatriate communities that we have in the world, and uh, so it means that uh, yeah, it's uh, it's, uh, it's a best it's traditionally a country of uh, of uh, of immigrants uh, since always since the the ones that left in the in the ship to go around the world. Uh, we have this tendency to go you know at the, the, to go to to explore to. But also to find better conditions of of of, of living, but uh, lost the ambassador briefly there. It's Paulo Costa. Are you there? Oh, there we are. Sorry, Ambassador. Ambassador, I'm afraid you're on mute. You're on mute. You see some tech technical difficulties. We'll just have to wait till they figure it out. <laughs> can I? Can you hear me now? Yes, Ambassador. Yeah. Please go ahead. Hmm? 
Can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Yeah, okay. So yeah, uh, sadly I don't remember what I was, I was saying before, but um, yeah, but I think I had come to, to yeah, I, I, I don't know if I answer your question, but. Um, Let's start clear then. Maria, what, what are we up to next? I believe you gave an excellent answer to the question, Ambassador, unless there's anything you would like to add. <laughs> we can, we can. Yeah, we can go ahead with the next question. Move on, yeah. Sounds good, perfect, okay. Our next question is, uh, what are some areas that Canada and Portugal can increase collaboration on, on the international stage? Yeah, you know, are very much um, the same as the Canadian uh, objectives and priorities. So, uh, in in that sense, it's very easy. It's very easy. We we cooperate and we collaborate um, immensely in the internet in all the international organization. It's uh, when we have an initiative, normally Canada uh, supports our initiative and vice versa. When Canada has an initiative in any field, we 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 support because it's 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 uh, it's uh, it's a natural support. Um, so, um, but of course, the, the defense and security is very important. Um, we are very much uh, like mine. Even in NATO, we defend more or less the same things. Uh, we have the same uh, approach. Uh, we favor very much the the. A, a big and, and, and strong connection between North America and, and Europe. It's not the case of, you know, in Europe, there's, there's different levels of support. There's countries in Europe that would like to see more, uh, a more aut autonomous Europe in terms of NATO and the others that favor more the relation with North America. And it's the case of Portugal and most of our the maritime countries in, in Europe are more favorable to the to the to the connection with uh, with uh, and and Canada defense is the same in that uh, to 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 you know to 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 interact and to and to cooperate with Canada. But of course, these um, specific areas where we where we have a very strong uh, um, uh, very, very strong uh, relation, for instance, climate change, all the big issues of the moment, like climate change, uh, the economic recovery post-COVID, uh, um, human rights, uh, um, equal rights between things that are very much our priorities and our objectives each time we are in the international stage. Uh, are the same as as Canada, so it's it's very easy. Uh, you know, it's it's very easy to to see. But I I, I would say that uh, these the big issues of 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 today, the big international issues like uh, like I mentioned, climate change and and uh, and um, and the the, the 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 economic recovery. Uh, um, we are in, in in we 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 agree entirely and and. Uh, and uh, and we have a lot of uh, we uh, even the oceans. Uh, uh, we are organizing next next year a big uh, um, the big United Nations Ocean Summit. It's going to be you know hosted by Portugal and Kenya, and uh, we hope for a big a big participation of of Canada, um, which is uh, it's it's also a subject that it's very important to to Canada. So. I would say you, you name it. Any any big priority for the international uh, for foreign policy of Canada uh, coincides with the with the with the, um, with the priorities of the 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 the, the Porsche's for uh, foreign policy. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador. And I believe we have time for just one more question. Uh, so to wrap up. How do you think uh, the role of institutions such as the United Nations is going to change as we're moving out of this pandemic? You know, I think the pandemic certainly exposed some of the faults and the drawbacks that these 
soft institutions have and how they are able to mitigate global disasters. Uh, and so what do you see as the future for cooperation within the context of the United Nations and its different um, committees and subgroups as well? Well, it, it's, it's almost a cliche to say that the United Nations is what the member states of the United Nations want it to be, you know? Uh, so, um, yes, the United Nations has to, has to have a role. Uh, of course, the, 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 the pandemic was not a very big success for the, for the health, um, or, uh, the United Nations Health Organization. Um, was not uh, and 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 and, uh, and we have to come out of this crisis with a with a, a big question on, on, on I think there is no other there is no alternative to the United Nations to to deal with some of the of today's issues in, in the international stage uh, and uh, and uh, I hope I I hope now, again, with a more favorable uh, uh, look from the, the American administration, which is the biggest uh, um, contributing to contributor to the to the budget of the United Nations, with uh, with the United States more present uh, uh, um, in in the, in many of in many of the institutions of the United Nations, um, the, the 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 organization will will become a little bit more. Uh, more active, but also um, uh, more independent in some areas where they 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 they, they were not more recently. Uh, but yeah, of course, it's it's uh, it's going to be it's going to be a, a very important um, uh, playground for 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 international politics uh, and uh, and. Uh, and um, and uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's uh, but but again, it's the member states that will that will say what they want to, uh, and and mainly the f the five uh, permanent members of the Security Council um, that they would allow for the United Nations to become to to play that role or not, you know, uh, for. Lately, the United Nations doesn't. That even if the all the efforts of the Secretary General are to you know to, to have a more uh, interventive uh, uh, approach to the to, to everything that uh, that is uh, this that uh, the, 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 all all the things that uh, are discussed internationally, the fact is that uh, um, the fact is that only only what the the the, the member states wanted to be. It uh, the, the United Nations can be so um, depends very much on the on the United States, Russia, on China, and and, uh, and also on the European powers that uh, are members of, but also of all the international community that will push for a more intervention of the United Nations or not, and um, yeah, and the, the fact is that the United Nations has been losing. Um, grounds and uh, and there's uh, and I think that the international order would uh, would benefit from the fact that uh, the United Nations will will come back to have a more a more more interventive uh, uh, approach to international affairs. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Uh, yeah. And thank you for your fascinating presentation. I think your insight on uh, the relations between Portugal and Canada and uh, uh, diplomatic relations more broadly at this time is very, very valuable for us. So thank you again for joining us today. And with that, I'll hand, uh, hand it over to President Robert Baines to wrap up. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, some great questions that you were able to bring forth and I really appreciate you moderating this discussion. Uh, Ambassador, I have one last question for you. One of our great goals at the NATO Association of Canada is to make sure that people appreciate the value of um, the cultural flourishing that is the result of our security. So the kinds of culture that we're always uh, enjoying 
We're always consuming, whether that be on Netflix or uh, an open air festival, uh, you know, fingers crossed for this summer. Um, what do you think are some of the best ways that uh, Portugal and Portuguese culture in Canada help to uh, explain peace? Or what do you think are some of the best um, outputs of peace that Portuguese culture have brought to Canada? Is it uh, egg tarts or uh, uh, Camoes and his beautiful lyric poetry, his epic poetry? What is it that you would say that Portuguese culture is the like, best to experience? Well, you know, uh, yeah, the, the Porsche starts definitely. I love them, and uh, I love them too much. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but yes, literature. We have uh, a few, a few important writers from Portugal that are translated into English and French, and that can be can be read, can can be acquired here in in Canada. So we have a. Uh, 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 quite important uh, literature, uh, but we also, we also have a lot of music from different kinds that uh, that uh, we normally bring here, and uh, and some of them they they come through the, the normal circuits. Uh, we have good examples of uh, of um, Canadian uh, loose or Canadian. Um, singers like Nelly Furtado and and, uh, and Sean Mendes that are of Portuguese descent and, and uh, that are really Canadian of uh, Portuguese descent. Uh, uh, so uh, we have uh, the music, literature, um, and, and uh, uh, yes, we have we have a uh, yeah the the food. Uh, it's not only the the, the Portuguese start. The, the the it's it's also the the food that you'll see in many restaurants around around the um, uh, in many restaurants around the around Canada a lot of Portuguese restaurants and and uh, and, and 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 you know there's more more and more Porsche, uh, Canadian tourists going to Portugal nowadays um, and and these uh, and 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 that they can experience there. Uh, more, uh, more closely our culture and our uh, and this culture that cannot be um, exported, like the monuments, like the 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 weather, like the 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 the, 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 the you know the, the the relation with the people. So a lot of Canadians are going and coming back with a with a the experience, and that experience tells you more about the culture of the country than things that it can that we can export that are important, of but course. they are not uh, that. Will not tell you everything about the country. Well, ambassador, so if you have I to may, go. you have to go and experience. Of locally. course, of course. But if I may, um, we would love to uh, once COVID allows us to uh, to help you to celebrate Portuguese culture in Canada. So next time you have a a great concert or a food festival or anything else uh, in Canada, the NATO Association would love to be there to help celebrate. I'm sure our members would join. Um, because that is real, the, the, that's the true dividend of NATO. It is the peace and the cultural flourishing that is possible from that. And Portuguese culture is such an important aspect. So, oh, there seems to be a... Uh, a emergency <laughs> alert, yes. An emergency alert. Oh, yes. don't we love our, our current world? <laughs> well, um, that's it for well, us, Ambassador. No, thank you very much. And thank you very much for having me and for this very interesting uh, exchange of, uh, of ideas. And, and um, yeah, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm, we are open to, to the continue to have this, uh, to, uh, this relation with, uh, with the NATO Association of Canada. Wonderful. Well, uh, for those watching, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Your Excellency, it's an honor. Uh, and uh, if anybody would like to continue hearing our events, please be sure to uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, NATO Canada, uh, and to follow us on uh, all the social media platforms. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador. Once again, a pleasure. And Maria, thanks. And thanks. Thank you. Thank you.